Okay, hi guys, um, today we are going to be covering the limbic system. Um, so for this one specifically, um, I added more diagrams and I also used um, like a little bit of um, extra help from the textbook, but because this is such like an in-depth system, um, I didn't want to be adding stuff that like wasn't relevant. So mainly, like like 99 percent of this is the the lecture that we were given it's just um i hope put in in a way that's easier to understand and um and it's also like the layout of diagrams and stuff i hope is better um just to, to understand okay so here goes so firstly um I don't know, I mean, I don't think this is important, but they do say that limbic means border, and that just relates to the fact that it borders the diencephalon. That might help you to remember that it is part of the telencephalon, which we know um, is originally from the prosencephalon. So the prosencephalon became these two things, di and telencephalon. And so the limbic system is like, I'd say, the most primitive part of the telencephalon. And then, you know, as you go further up, it becomes more complicated and more, like, um, more developed, so to speak. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, now, also, it is, like, a visceral brain, and we'll see later on how it interacts with the autonomic nervous system. And, um... It's also functioning to do all of these things. Defense, homeostasis, reproduction. Um, it's involved in that. And it has connections to the thalamus, particularly the anterior nucleus and dorsomedial nucleus. Um, so we will get to those as well. And yeah, it is important in memory, uh, which is going to be extensively covered here. Okay, to begin, I wanted to include this diagram. I think it is quite nice because it includes like pretty much everything of the entire limbic system. So, including that circuit that I'm about to tell you about. Okay, so the circuit, circuit um, that is concerned with the acquisition of new memory is called the circuit of Pepe or Pepez, uh, however you pronounce it. And... Um, you could, well, because it's a circuit, you could begin anywhere, but, like, you can begin at the hippocampus, for example. And as you can see, the hippocampus moves up here into this fornix, and then the fornix moves along in a C-shape all the way around to those mammillary bodies, and then from the mammillary bodies upwards into the thalamus. Um, mammillary bodies is part of the um, hypothalamus, just as a reminder. And then from... This part here, which is the thalamus, we move up into this cortex, the singular gyrus. From the singular gyrus, we work our way back down to the parahippocampal gyrus, and from the parahippocampal gyrus back in deeply, um, like deep to the parahippocampal gyrus is obviously the hippocampus. So we get back there, and the circuit is complete. Uh, notably, the this uh, parahippocampal gyrus has connections to the like neocortex, the one that's like really high. It has connections to the sensory association areas. But we'll see a diagram that like outlines that to show that, you know, it's not just a closed circuit. You know, there's interactions allowing this circuit to function because um, it can't just be sending the same information over and over again in a cycle. So, you know, there has to be some sort of interaction with other parts. And so there is. Um, so I think getting to know this diagram is a good idea. Um, and then, uh, if we look at the way the amygdala, sorry, the, the limbic system works, it, uh, um, yeah, so it's like, it's like building up from simple, which is the amygdala, which is mainly just nuclei, building up to something that has layers. If we think back to histology, um, you know, like the layers that she was explaining, for example, in the neocortex, there were like six layers um, that she explained, so information is moving, um, and being, like, processed in, like, further and further complex regions, okay, 
Now, what are the components of the limbic system? So it's the limbic lobe, the hippocampal formation, and the amygdaloid body, or we could just say amygdala. Okay, so the limbic lobe is the hippocampus, parapineal gyrus, and the cingulate gyrus. Um, hippocampal formation, it's, uh, if you think about this, just think of what is close to the hippocampus. So the hippocampal formation is consisting of the hippocampus again. The dentate gyrus, which is an outgrowth of the hippocampus, you'll see just now. And the parahippocampal gyrus, which is very close by as well. And then the amygdaloid body um, is, like I said, made up of the, just like nuclei mainly, the four main nuclear complexes. And then the amygdala itself is found... That's just its location, which is at the anterior end of the inferior horns, which is lateral ventricle. So when you do a little coronal section here, you'll be able to see it right there, where you might expect to see the hippocampus, but if you cut it anterior enough, you will see the amygdala instead. And um, obviously, if you cut further back, you will see the um, hippocampus. Um, and then I've also included these other diagrams from the original lecture. It's pretty good diagrams. Like, I think here's the hippocampus forming the fornix coming up and around it, that C-shaped fornix. Okay. And then there was also other components of the limbic system. So just to refresh, we talked about components for the limbic system being its lobe. The limbic lobe, which forms that big C-shape, you know, like the cingulate going all the way around, parahippocampal gyrus, including hippocampus. And then hippocampal formation, which is hippocampus, dentate, and parahippocampal gyrus, everything in that region. And then the amygdaloid body, which was an, at the anterior end of inferior horns, so it's in front of the hippocampus. And now we're talking about other components as well. The dentate gyrus, we mentioned that already. The septal area, you will see that in a diagram later. The hypothalamus, and if you remember the hypothalamus, it was like the controller of the endocrine system. And um, particularly, it's the mammillary body that's involved. Um, and we did, we did talk about that right at the beginning, the diagram, which showed the mammillary body projecting to the thalamus, particularly this nucleus here. If You can, you can go back to the thalamus lecture and um, it will describe that in detail um, so from the mammillary body the mammillothalamic tract sends information to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus that's part of the circular papay that's part of acquisition of your memory and that will ultimately get to the cingulate gyrus continuing that circuit okay and then there's something called indicium grisium this lecture is weird because um there's some things that they just state and then they don't like further explain like the septal area and indicium grisium. But it would probably be a good idea to know where about it is and maybe what's connected to it. But for the indicium grisium, I know that it is gray matter on top of this thing here, which is corpus callosum. Now we know corpus callosum is white matter. It's connecting the two cerebral hemispheres. And so indicium grisium has to be a different type of matter. It is gray matter, a, la a layer of gray matter that is on top of corpus callosum. And um, this is, remember we talked about the septal area. Let's just take a look down here. There it is, septal area. And yeah, that's just other components involved in the limbic system. Uh, like those other two lectures, like the thalamus and um, the uh, cerebellum, uh, there's a lot of like pathways involved in circuits, but Rennie did, uh, she said it a lot in that lecture where she was like, oh, worried and stuff. She said it a lot that like, we don't have to go so in depth with pathways and, and die and, and circuits and stuff. So we just have to know the components and we have to know like their function or something. She said, it, she simply, she simplified what we actually have to know. So we don't have to go so hectic into certain things, just knowing that they are components and knowing what those components um, are involved with, I guess. But yeah, so limbic lobe, hippocampal formation, amygdaloid body, and then all of these other components. Okay, and we move. Right, so I'm going to focus on the limbic lobe, particularly on the hippocampus itself. We know where it's located. 
forming the, the part of the floor of the inferior horns, which is part of the lateral ventricle. It is covered by a layer of white matter. That white matter is called alveus. Alveus, if as it goes more medially, so it's covering it's covering the um, the hippocampus. So the hippocampus looks like this. I think, and then, and then you have like a layer on top of it. That's your alveus. Alveus forms. It's this layer, okay? And then it's forming something at this end, at the medial end. And that is fimbria. So that's what alveus is going to form. And then fimbria will continue and get bigger, and it becomes the fornix. Sorry for the terrible diagram. <laughs> okay, so it becomes the fornix. And we know fornix then leads to mammillary body, which is part of the hypothalamus. The mammillary body via the mammilla, the lambic tract leads to the thalamus, the anterior nucleus particularly, and from that to the singular gyrus, from the singular gyrus to the parahippocampal gyrus, and the circuit continues. And uh, just a reminder, obviously, that the parahippocampal gyrus does uh, have an, uh, a way of like getting out of the circuit. It sends messages back and forth to the sensory association areas of the neocortex, you know, right at the top. Okay, now also... I talked about how the dentate gyrus is formed. It's an outgrowth of the cortical tissue. Now, just to simplify it, because we talked about white matter before, cortical tissue is obviously gray matter. So outgrowth of the gray matter of the hippocampus forms the dentate gyrus. And just a reminder here, that's part of hippocampal formation. Hippocampal formation is obviously the hippocampus itself, the dentate gyrus, and the parahippocampal gyrus as well. So, we move on to its connections. Now, the hippocampus has connections, two-way connections to the neocortex, to olfactory areas. Um, if you look at this diagram, it's also involved. Um, and to the opposite hippocampus via the fornix. Um, uh, it's some sort of commissure. I think it's called the commissure of the fornix, but you just have to check. I'm not sure if it's um, if it has a different name, but yeah, it's like a commissure between the four fornixes, fornices, connecting the hippocampuses together, and then it has connections also with the reticular formation, and we know that's involved with um, arousal. Now. Um, Again, I'm just emphasizing the circuit. This is how it goes from the hippocampus um, to the fornix, and then the fornix takes it to the mammillary body, mammillary body to the anterior nucleus of thalamus, to the singular gyrus, to the, all the way back down to the hippocampal formation, basically. And that is what I just said, but in detail. And here is what I said about the parahippocampal gyrus being able to communicate with the neocortex. Um, so basically, it's like the fornix is almost a pathway. See, it's a pathway that the hippocampus has to use to get to this region. And then the pathway that the mammillary bodies use to get to the thalamus is the mammillothalamic tract. Yeah, it's just a whole lot of pathways. <laughs> okay, and then this diagram, the one right at the start of the lecture, again, is a really good one because um, it, okay, it's a label diagram, so you can see where everything is in place. Okay, so let's talk about the functions of the hippocampal formation. So... Um, the hippocampal formation is all about memory, episodic memory, which is the autobiographical um, events and like memories that you form. Um, so um, we'll get to it at the end, but the clinical considerations will involve like if you damage your hippocampus, your, your memory is obviously going to get affected. It'll be difficult to actually form new memories. Um, now, the hippocampus itself is the auto-associator, meaning, uh, like, when you see something, when you get, like, a stimulus, it tells you, it kind of tries to relate to what it knows from memory to tell you what that is. So, an auto-associator, it's associating things with other things. The dentate gyrus, though, is a pattern separator. So, it, okay, now you know what it is, but... We want to know specifically what it is, so we need to, we need to be able to uh, make things less similar, so we can distinguish exactly what something is. So the dentate gyrus is the pattern separator, and then the subiculum, 
sorry about introducing an entirely new word without even prefacing it, but subaculum is a pattern completer. It's just part of the circuit. So just note that we're still in the circuit of Papez or Papay or whatever. This is just specific functions of components within that circuit. So um, let's look at that again. We did speak about the hippocampus and here it is. Um, the dentate gyrus on the medial side. We'll see another diagram for that. And the subiculum, I have a better diagram for that here. Okay, this this diagram is not from the lecture, so I just added it in um, just to help us like visualize and understand what this all looks like. So, here's the parahippocampal gyrus, right? And it's leading in. Interrhinal cortex is in this region. And here is the subiculum. Here it's, it's like labeled... So the subiculum is here, which then leads to the actual hippocampus, and the hippocampus then leads to the dentate gyrus. That's how we can form a circuit. Um, cause okay, and then remember we covered with alveus here. Alveus then forms fimbria, fimbria forms fornix, and um, we will see later, um, in those hectic circuits and diagrams that they added in the original lecture, how these all come into play, how the subiculum is part of that circuit, dentate gyrus, we said it's a pattern separator, subiculum, um, we said it's a pattern completer, and then the hippocampus itself, the auto-associator. Um, and then, remember when, when we said, I remember, I, 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 sorry, I mentioned the histology part of this, how the amygdala is, um, like just nuclei and then the hippocampus is a three to four layered cortex and then we move on to a neocortex which is a six layered cortex um six layered cortex well here is those three layers it's outer molecular middle pyramidal and inner polymorphic just as a point of interest <laughs> sorry um so that's your hippocampal formation remember everything i said everything near the hippocampus performs part of that we have our our parahippocampal gyrus, we have the actual hippocampus, and we have the dentate gyrus. Subiculum is involved there as well. Now, um, this is um, particularly relating to these three functions, the, the auto-associator, the pattern separator, and the pattern completer. So, um, just for a second, let's look at this diagram. Um, just note how the interrhinal cortex projects straight out there to the dentate gyrus. It's not going along this whole pathway here, it's going whoop, straight up. And then we also know that this parahippocampal gyrus has access to other regions of the brain. There it is. Sensory association areas can be accessed via the parahippocampal gyrus. We're still in that circuit, okay? And then obviously, you know, your your alveus and then your fimbria and then the fornix thereafter. Here is your subiculum, which is actually between your internal cortex, parahippocampal gyrus region, between that and your actual hippocampus. So, um, and then obviously the dentate gyrus at the end of that whole turn. Um, but let's look at this circuit. So we started at the cortex, and the cortex was able to communicate with the interrhinal cortex. Oh, I wonder how. It's a two-way connection to the sensory association areas. That's how. We just proved that already. Interrhinal cortex, connection going all the way up to this place. Okay, then it comes down to the interrhinal cortex, right? And then it's moving on to the dentate gyrus. Now, the dentate gyrus, we said, is here. How can the interrhinal cortex here go to the dentate gyrus? Why, why doesn't it move all the way along these things? Nope, no, it doesn't do that. It has connections to the dentate gyrus that's more convenient and then um that makes sense because okay you sensed something your brain's trying to figure out what it is sent the information down to the limbic uh system limbic system is going to say okay let's decide what it is send it to the dentate gyrus pattern is separated don't get confused by ca3 and ca1 it just means cornu ammonis in cornu ammonis one because another name for the hippocampus is ammon's horn and in latin horn is cornu and in latin ammon is ammonis so i yeah it's just weird latin or whatever so it's just they name different parts of the hippocampus 
to CA1, CA2, CA3, and CA4, but that is definitely not important for us. There's no way we can identify that in a spotter. But yeah, so project, basically, we're going from cortex to interanal cortex, to dentate gyrus, to hippocampus, okay? Dentate gyrus can easily go to the hippocampus, coming out of that loop. And then from the hippocampus, we're moving to the subaculum. Oh, that's convenient. From the dentate, hippocampus, subaculum. There it is. Convenient. Done. We're in the subaculum now. Subaculum, whoop, let's just go down. Bam, interanal cortex. We're back. Circuit complete. And um, we also want to be able to further process it. So if we wanted to further process it, this is obviously not going to be in the diagram here, but if we wanted to further process it, we could send it um, along this pathway. This pathway is fimbria. Fimbria goes to the fornix, and the fornix goes to the mammillary bodies. The mammillary bodies to the thalamus, thalamus to the cingulate gyrus, and it'll go on a loop all the way back to this region. Or, once we figured out what it is, we could send information, you know, from, uh, let's say we're at the interrhinal cortex. Interrhinal cortex can project to the dentate. Gen dentate comes all the way out along these paths. From dentate gyrus to the hippocampus, from dentate gyrus to the hippocampus, and the, sorry, from dentate gyrus to the hippocampus, from the hippocampus to subaculum, subaculum to interrhinal cortex, and we know that the interrhinal cortex can speak to these regions, and we can finally figure out whatever, um, whatever it was, you know, whatever stimulus it was, which, which is what we're trying to figure out. Um, so basically, it makes sense. Like if you think about it, so you, obviously when your brain sees something, obviously we do it faster for for things that we know. Why is that? It's because of our brain having those connections and, and being able to identify using memories what things are, you know? Like, it's these things are annoying. Like These circuits are annoying, but if you bring it into context of a real-life situation, if you bring it into context of what your brain is trying to do, your brain is trying to take information from the association areas, process it along this, doing all of these random things. <laughs> okay, not random, logical things. It's doing all of these things. To figure out what that stimulus is. And that is why it does make sense. Um, and there's that note that I made on Ammon's horn. Okay, Cornu Ammonis. Ammon's horn. Just another name for hippocampus. Now, what did we do already? So we've covered hippocampal formation. We've covered um, the actual limbic lobe with the focus on the hippocampus itself. Now we're going to go on to the amygdala, which is compo composed of like nuclei and stuff. Um, the main ones, lateral, basal, central, central median. Um, the main afferent is the lateral one. And the main efferent is this last one here, uh, central median. It's just nuclei and words and things. Okay. So, the main input into the amygdala is from the cortex. Um, yeah, so this is particularly involved, I think as an intro, we should say that it is involved in emotion. So, if we know it's involved in emotion, try to relate the fact that it's trying to add emotion to whatever's connecting to it. That should help you, like... Make sense of it. Well, okay, that helped me uh, make sense of it. And, um, so, if we're projecting from the cortex and the thalamus, and we're connecting, projecting from raphe and catecholamine, catecholamine nuclei of the reticular formation, those are, that's just very wordy, okay? And that doesn't make sense to me until I think of the fact that the amygdala is involved in emotion, and if it's cortex and thalamus, it's... Um, Obviously, you're in an environment and you've got, got like sensory information. So your cortex is sending it through the thalamus. It's just a relay station. Um, and then also, that would be for adding emotion to whatever event is occurring at that point. And then if we talk about reticular formation, it's no use just getting all like emotional and not being able to actually do anything about it. If something hectic is happening, your body needs to react Um by talking to the reticular formation because the reticular formation is obviously involved with this like arousal type thing so if you're sleepy and something hectic is happening like an emotionally charged event you need to like you know wake up like 
wake up um and uh, uh that's why the reticular formation is involved with the raphae and catecholamine nuclei basal will also be afferent the hippocampus projects here particularly ca4 and the subiculum also has connections to this place yeah so that um the previous circuit with the memories right so we have memories and okay think about it when you have memories <clears throat> when you have memories obviously um some like memories bring about certain emotions how like okay you need something connecting these two components otherwise you'll have memories without emotion that doesn't even make sense the hippocampus and subiculum which we know is part of that whole memory circuit needs to connect to the amygdala there needs to be emotion linked to memories and so this needs to happen and that uses the basal the basal nuclei that's just the name of the nucleus whatever central lateral is also one of the main of the four and then central median very important this is efferent now so the efferent tract from the amygdala is stria terminalis so if we if we look um if we look at like a cut of the brain We'll see, obviously, the fornix curving around in a C-shape. And we'll see stria, medullul stria medullaris going to the benular nucleus um, and to the pineal gland and whatever. But stria terminalis is the tract that the amygdala uses. Um, and we'll see that, I think, at the top of the thalamus. So we have stria terminalis is the tract that it uses. To get to the septal area, we mentioned that right at the beginning. Here's a septal area area again. Um, just to highlight the tract that it's using. Um, I think it's here. Oopsie. Yeah, it's this one here. Going around. Um, yeah, so that's stride terminalis. It gets it to these various places, hypothalamus, septal area. Now, why? Again, if you use logic and think about why it's doing this, then it, it just makes sense. Okay, so like paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, you just have to learn that it's involved with a pathway that um, leads to cortisol. I added this picture in here just as a reminder. Cortisol is the stress hormone, okay? Why do we need cortisol? <laughs> Why? Huh? Because, like, if there's a stressful situation, then you need to react accordingly. And so an emotionally charged event is trying to bring about cortisol release. And that's how it does it. Central median nucleus of the amygdala projects to... The hypothalamus and the hypothalamus which controls all the hormones in the body releases this guy the stress hormone okay um and that's the pathway of it obviously we don't have to know this anymore this is i mean we do have to know it but we don't have to know this for i'm just reminding you about how we can get cortisol yeah and then this lateral hypothalamus that it projects to as well the lateral hypothalamus has connections to the autonomic nervous system Autonomic nervous system is obviously, you know, your sympathetic and parasympathetic type stuff. Obviously, if you have an emotionally charged event, you can think of different things that happen, like crying, for example, um, which is para parasympathetic, I think, because that would be the lacrimal gland, which is involved with the uh, a para parasympathetic um, nervous system. Wow. Um, what is it? Superior salivatory nucleus. So it needs to be involved with the autonomic nervous system as well. If you just relate it to the fact that emotions bring about autonomic responses, then you'll know that this is obviously important. I mean, it's like necessary for this to exist. And the fact that I already spoke about a stressful situation and you need the stress hormone. And then also the periaqueductal gray matter, which is in the midbrain. Here it is. Um, and that is a freeze response in animals. Okay, nearly done. <laughs> okay, um, so I spoke about, I mentioned stria medullaris, 
striamidalaris thalami, which goes to herbinularis. These are just some important connections that they also said. Now, I don't know how deep we have to go, but I'm, I'll, just, I'll just explain it. And if we have to know it, then you can learn. But I don't know how important it is. But here goes, okay? So we have the septal area we mentioned already. That sends fibers to the habenular nuclei, okay? I mean, if you want to know the pathway that it uses, cool. Stramadalia medullaris, wow, okay. And then the habenular nuclei will also receive afferents from the globus pallidus, which is involved with basal ganglia, right? And now the habenularis, we just said that there's these two guys, okay? We said the septal area is going to it. Globus pallidus is going to it. And then this nucleus, which all of these guys projected to, is going through the reticular formation to autonomic nuclei. We know autonomic nuclei. Edinger West Falls, Superior Inferior Salivatory, Dorsal Motor Nucleus of Vegas. So, yeah, it goes to that. That is mean, that like means that the neocortex and corpus striatum, and if, or corpus striatum is obviously basal ganglia, it's, it's involved, it's called an imputament, um, but it's just showing us how, you know, the basal ganglia and septal area use this guy, <laughs> use this guy to basically influence autonomic activity, which means that the neocortex and corpus striatum can influence our autonomic activity using the abenularis as its sort of relay station, if you want to understand it that way. And finally, I think finally, okay, wow. <laughs> Almost finally, okay. The medial forebrain bundle is um, seemingly important also in, in, in these connections. Again, we start at the septal area. And then, so they want to communicate. These areas also want to communicate with areas lower down. And they use the medial forebrain bundle, this um, pink purple thing here. Um, so this tract will connect the septal area, the hypothalamus, which you can see is like the purple thing is going into it, and the raphe nuclei of the reticular formation. We mentioned raphe nuclei of reticular formation earlier, which was involved, um, I think, with the amygdala. And now some of, some of its fibers will reach the dorsal nucleus of vagus and the nucleus of tractus solitarius. Again, to understand why it needs to connect to all these things, um, well, just think of what is the purpose of these guys. Nucleus of tractus solitarius is going to give you taste. So, I mean, surely, you know, when you eat something really tasty, it, could, it like brings about um, emotions and stuff. <laughs> See, that's how, that's like, it's logical, but um, these are kind of heavy circuits. Uh, but I hope my diagrams and drawings and explanations help. There's the clinical considerations um, with behavior and thought disorders. It is a problem, okay, for anxiety, overactivity of the amygdala. So it's like too much emotions, overpowering things, and that's how anxiety, uh, anxiety depression is. Wow, uh, okay, that doesn't explain what depression is, but it does say that the drug treatment is either preventing the breakdown of norepinephrine or um, increasing its, like, uptake. So, oh, it's binding or whatever. So there's more norepinephrine, and that helps depression, okay? For schizo, um, it has to antagonize dopamine. I think that's why they even included this slide in the original slides. Just to show us the different dopaminergic systems. Um, so dopamine is involved in the mesolimbic pathway. Um, and if it's over-involved, you get schizo. So the drug treatment will have to antagonize that. And with memory disorders, we spoke about how the hippocampus is vital to memory formation. So obviously if you damage the hippocampus, be it a head injury, where um, I think it's the greater wing of the sphenoid, um, pushes against your temporal lobe that will obviously damage the part that is underneath all of that, the hippocampus. Or hypoxia. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but the hippocampus is susceptible to hypoxia because it's so deep in there, you know? So hypoxia could affect it or surgical resection of the fornix if you have like epilepsy or something. 
um, and that will damage your hippocampus and that will give you memory disorders. Let's talk about short-term memory, which can be affected. Um, in Alzheimer's, you can't really form new memories because this hippocampus is degenerated. In carcinoma psychosis related to alcohol um, abuse, where your thalamus and mammillary body is damaged. The circuit is not complete and therefore short-term memory problems. Um, that's because of the metabolic disturbance that led to its damage, but yeah. Okay, long-term memory, apparently the serotonergic raphane neurons that project to the hippocampus are active and that helps us consolidate new memories. And um, yeah, I think I did mention the raphane neurons um, earlier, which I think were connecting to the amygdala. Right, and then here is diagram just again showing what everything looks like in place uh one thing i didn't mention was nucleus accumbens that's actually part of the, the basal ganglia and it is the reward center okay i think we are done um Oh yeah, and just one more thing, anterior nucleus of thalamus and medial, dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus is also involved. And yeah, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Goodbye.